Okay, your center of power, and thanks, Audrey, for doing that. We're continuing, our, we're exploring the heart of enlightened Christianity, continuing our alternative Christian series. How many of you feel like you're, you are an alternative Christian or would like to consider yourself that way? Probably most of us. We want to stay in, in that um, Christian community, right? But we don't identify with much of what we have picked up there. And I, in this series, I've been doing a lot of research on things like salvation and just some of the general ideas about Jesus dying for our sins and all that kind of thing. And so you can go on, you can do a lot of research to kind of confirm where you no longer are probably on all of this. And it's difficult, what's the difficult thing is unless you look at a good scholarly website, you won't really get that um, the, most of the beliefs that we picked up, most of the things that are put on the uh, message of Jesus, for example, are not, the, not from the gospel of Jesus himself, because we don't have one of those. They are the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as I have explained, they probably started, every one of them probably started with a list of sayings. Actually, Mark was the first gospel written, even though it's not in that sequence in our, in our Bible, in our New Testament. But uh, it's recognized that Mark was the first gospel written because Matthew and Luke include almost all of Mark in their writing. So they, they were using the gospel of Mark, and they also used another source, Scholars have labeled the Q source, which means uh, it uh, comes from the German word QL, which means source. And um, it was a list of sayings, no narrative around them. They, this is uh, what they believe. And then Matthew and Luke also had their own material that they added that's unique to, to them. And if you put all the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, side by side this is how they how they root these things out and so the and then John comes along much later um, Mark was written around 60 AD or so that that date varies depending on who you read Matthew and Luke around 70 75 AD and then John 90 to 100 AD quite a bit later and it's uh, thought that John was derived from a book called the Book of Signs, and it's a completely different tradition about Jesus. But what we, the way these writers started, just imagine Mark. He's he's been he has a list of sayings that have been passed down uh, for thirty years. Uh, he's heard what people have said, and people have passed on to him some, you know, the church leaders. And when you think of church leaders in the early days, you don't think of church as we think of it today. You think of a group of people getting together, probably in hiding, uh, meeting, talking about the life of Jesus, talking about some things they heard him say or heard about him. It was all passed on by word of mouth, and we know how that works. It's called hearsay. It's not acceptable in court of law today. But um, very few people could read or write. So you have this, this writer. We call him Mark. We don't know who the, any of the authors of the four Gospels were. None of the, the oldest uh, copies we have, which were written 150 years after the death of Jesus. I mean, that's the earliest that, that is available. Anything earlier is just destroyed. It's gone. Uh, but this person that we'll call him Mark just for convenience sat down and started putting together an official story of who Jesus was been passed down through oral tradition up to this point and so so Mark puts in writing the story of Jesus and he would take a saying you can imagine how this would work there's no narrative around it no story he would take a saying of Jesus, attributed to Jesus, and he would write the story around it. If Jesus was speaking to, say, a group of disciples or a group of Pharisees or whatever, that was unknown. That would be the invention of 
uh, of the, the rider. And so the problem is when a writer like this would take a saying of Jesus and couch it in a narrative, we have to understand that the narrative belongs to the author, not to Jesus himself. And the meaning that's given to a particular saying is put it couched in a narrative that gives it a particular meaning. We talked about that last week. So it's a, uh, a thing that most of us are not going to pick up on because you have to actually delve into uh, the scholarly side of this. And by scholar, I'm talking about what they call a critical scholar. That is one who takes more of a scientific approach. They, they take a gospel like uh, Mark and they try to understand how it came about, uh, how it was put together. A religious scholar doesn't have that problem. The, what the religious scholar says is, well, God dictated to Mark what to say, what to write. And it's just that simple. So that's the word of God. That's how it's seen as the infallible word of God. The critical scholar doesn't see it that way. They see it as being having been put together by people. And the sources they used came from other people, and um, a story was told. And the story is different. The, the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are known as synoptics, the synoptic Gospels, because they were written from a common point of view. John was from an entirely different point of view. It's known as the spiritual gospel, but historians or uh, scholars think it's the least historically accurate of, of the four. Paul also basically has a gospel, and his, his message is the most accurate of all because it comes directly from him. And Paul had some interesting ideas about who Jesus was, but uh, that's the gospel according to Paul. It's still not a gospel according to Jesus. So that's the problem we have. And what we are doing in this series is looking for that mystical thread that is not an interpretation uh, from the early church writers. Uh, remember, the writers were evangelists. They were not historians or biographers. And just think today, if you're reading uh, a book written by an evangelist compared to one written by an historian or a biographer, you're going to see a very different presentation. The evangelist will take the religious slant, the religious point of view, and that's really the whole Old Testament. It is, uh, it's, it's based loosely on history, but the point of nearly all of the writers is here's how God would intervene, here's how God would behave in this historical account, which we're going to look at one of those today. But that's uh, something most of us are not exposed to, certainly not in, in traditional churches. But um, there's a great deal available, and um, I once interviewed uh, one of the scholars from the Jesus Seminar, which was big in the mid-70s, late-70s or so, uh, early 80s maybe, uh, and has produced a, an excellent um, amount of work, but it was a group of 100 scholars, and when I was in Springfield at the church there, we had one of the scholars, um, Charles Hedrick, and I brought him in up on stage on a Wednesday night and did an interview with him, and uh, it was a very interesting thing. People really enjoy that, and I th thought sometime if we can set up another type of thing like that, that you would, would all probably enjoy it. But there's a whole different Bible, you know, when you, when you approach it from the scholarly point of view, and I don't consider myself a scholar, I consider myself a fan of scholarship. You know, I like to know how this thing was written. I don't have to believe that the earth, that, you know, the universe was made in six days any more than I have to believe that everything we see in this universe came from something smaller than an atom and it blew up one day in the Big Bang. I think the Bible is more credible than that, frankly, but I you know, could be wrong. But it's a, um, I don't have to believe that the, that the whole universe was created in six days, but I can say they did. You know, the Hebrew believed that. What the Hebrew was trying to say is God's the source of it all. In the beginning, God, that's the message. 
And that's usually what we are wanting to say, or wanting to, uh, that's usually what they were wanting to say. And we get to the New Testament, and we have a story about Jesus, that he died for our sins, he was the only begotten son, and this and that. Um, but when you look at the actual words attributed to Jesus, you don't necessarily come up with that same idea, that same plan. And so we understand that the theology, the teachings that uh, are generally called Christianity are really the teachings of the gospel writers and the New Testament writers, uh, not necessarily the teachings of Jesus. The difference between the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, and the gospel of Jesus. We simply don't have gospel of Jesus. But as I read the words that are attributed to him, some things jump out at me that would be, I would consider the gospel or good news. I like hearing what he had to say in that regard. So we'll look at one of these here. A very famous one that he is uh, quoted as saying, and again, does it matter who says something that's true? Does it matter what the source is if it's true? Does it matter who really invented the first airplane? Because they did not invent the laws of aerodynamics, the truth behind the airplane. They invented a, a mechanism that would embody certain principles, eternal principles, and so we have this thing called an airplane. I, I, we saw the first um, airplane out in, where is that? I can't remember, you remember where it is, Kitty Hawk, or, yeah. And, you know, I wouldn't want to fly in that thing. But they started embodying an invisible set of principles, and it started working. And they improved upon that. They never did improve upon the principles, though. So these planes that we're seeing flying overhead today are using the same principles, but it's a much deeper rendition, a much deeper interpretation, we'd say. So you wouldn't take that first airplane literally in, in terms of this is the truth, this is it. You would see it for what it is. It's embodying a certain idea. And so it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, we're, when we, we're speaking of sources, we're not looking at Wright Brothers or whoever came after. We're looking at universal principle. That's the source. And if I hear that, in other words, if I see an airplane fly over, I know they got it. You know, it's, it bears witness to the truth. And when you're reading things, it doesn't matter if some Eastern mystic wrote it or some Western, um, somebody on a LSD trip wrote it, if it's true. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what the source is if they have tapped into universal truth. I'm not recommending that by any means, but you see what I'm saying. Truth is truth, and we know it when we hear it. We know it, we feel it, you know, we feel, we resonate with it. So Jesus says here, and I'm not going to keep saying these words are attributed to Jesus, I'm just gonna act as if he said them because that's a lot more convenient. He said, have faith in God. And that uh, statement right there is a, it's a good reminder to all of us when we're going through a, a, a problem. Have faith in God, what's happened here. <laughs> did you hit something or did I hit it? <laughs> well, there it is. I have faith in God that is coming back. That is a, uh, a thing that we need to stop and think about. Anytime we're having a challenge, where's my faith? So Jesus starts out with this, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So this is a, a principle, it's actually a set of principles that I respond to as truth. This is uh, what he's talking about here is embody it's an airplane that flies. It, it sets me in a state of mind that I see something here I could use, I could bring into my life. 
And well, are we talking about mountains? You know, but I would look at um, look at the uh, mesa, for example, and say cast into the sea. I, I, would I believe that could be true? I would never do that. I like the mesa. I don't want to cast it into the sea. But the mountain is anything. It's anything that you're involved in. What's going on in your life right now? What kind of a mountain do you have now? Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart and cast into the sea, it's get rid of it. Get this problem out of my life. That if we say that and we do not doubt in our heart that we fully embrace the truth of what we're saying, and it's not our power that's doing this, but believes that uh, that what he that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, and this sums it up: whatsoever, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you received it, and it will be yours. It's a shift in our own attitude, our own uh, understanding. If you have something going on in your life right now, just think about your relationship with that, something you would like to see cast into the sea, something you would like to see gone. And just think about how you're thinking about it. Are you using your mind to run down every single avenue of, of to how to resolve it? Are you looking at your resources, yourself? Are you uh, saying, how can I solve this? What can I do to solve this? So we're not saying here that we don't look at those things we're saying that we have faith in god that we move our focus away from our power away from ourselves and remember there is a power within us and this is a finding our own center of power it's moving to a place in yourself where you're no longer re responding or reacting in fear you're coming from a place where Okay, I don't know how this thing's going to be resolved, but I know it is. And you let go. And a, a very definite change occurs in you. That's whoever believes what he says uh, does not doubt in his heart. Do not doubt in your heart. And I find sometimes when I am praying about something, I am also equally doubting in my heart that because I don't know how it's going to be solved. And so I have to back off of that and say, it's not me that's going to be doing this. My faith is in God. It's a shift in perception, a shift in understanding, a finding of that center of power in yourself. And I have been very scattered. I know you have too. We all go through this, and uh, that's what fear is. It just scatters our energies. And what this is saying is reel yourself back in. You don't have to know the answer. You don't have to know how it's going to unfold to bring yourself back to your center of power, to get to that place where you do not doubt in your heart that it's going to uh, resolve, that it is in the process now of resolving. Okay, so this is coming home. We talked about the prodigal son, um, which I, I think is the gospel of Jesus. In my book, that's how I would define the gospel of Jesus. The prodigal son goes out into the far country, totally messes up, comes back, his father welcomes him with open arms. That to me would be the gospel of Jesus. That's what it's all about. Does, the son doesn't come back and the father stops him and says, oh, you gotta go for this toll booth first. You have to accept me as your personal savior or you have to do this or that. There's no condition whatsoever. It's just come home, I'm glad to see you. And he throws a big party and the, the other son that is saying, oh, he sinned and he ought to be punished. You know why? I've done everything right. I followed all the rules. You know, there's that side of our thinking that says, I've got to follow all these rules in order for God to be good to me. And we can almost get into this with our positive thinking stuff. You know, I had negative thoughts the other day. That's why this is happening. I'm being punished. What if you said to yourself, like you're the, you're the prodigal son that goes off and your thoughts are totally negative and you totally lose it? Do you think that changes God's attitude toward you? That parable says no, it doesn't. It can't. God is unconditional love. And I'm always welcome home. I may not make the choice to come home. And I don't make the choice to come home if I'm beating myself up. If I slip into that older son's attitude of, 
I've got to pay the price. What the father does in his case as well is he goes out to meet this sulking son and says, get over it. It's okay. Everything's okay. I love both of you. All that I have is my, all that I have is yours. That to me is the gospel, the good news that Jesus brought. It's God is unconditional love. And so we need to get over that. If we're having any kind of issues about conditional love, I did something bad and so I have to be punished for it in some way. That's what we all grew up in. And that's what I you know, said. Um, the sign out in the middle of Kansas, uh, if you were to die today, would, where would you spend eternity? That's the whole question that's being asked in traditional Christianity. It's all about what happens when I die. It's not about life. What's about life is make sure I'm on the straight and narrow. Make sure I'm staying in good graces with God. That's conditional love. And that's not what Jesus taught in that, uh, in that parable. I mean, that's not the idea that's being presented there. Okay, so we have an Old Testament thing, and I know this print is very small. I don't know if you can see it back there or not, but I'll read it. There's a story um, about, a, about Jehoshaphat, and the kingdom of Israel split into two sections at one point through their history, and the southern kingdom was known not as Israel but as Judah. And so this is a story that takes place in the southern part of the, that domain. And what happened is an alliance of enemies came against Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah. He fell into a state of fear. He got some bad news and he got nervous. He got scared. Uh, he set himself then to seek the Lord. That's his f second reaction. First reaction, fear. Second reaction is, okay, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. And what that means, basically, is everybody stop thinking fearfully. Let's take a fast. Let's not partake of that particular uh, part of the menu. Let's not buy into fear. Let's, let's take a break from that. Let's remember who we are. So he acknowledges the Lord as their source of power. This is a real long story. I would actually read it from the Bible, but uh, it's a very long story, so I'm breaking it down. He acknowledges the Lord as their source of power. His first reaction is fear, and then he seeks the Lord, and he declares a fast, and he's saying, let's change our thinking here. Let's change our perspective. He says, in thy hand, speaking, he's speaking to the Lord, are power and might. We are powerless. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. I love that statement, because how many times have you been there? How many times have I been there? I do not know what to do, but actually Jehoshaphat did know what to do. He put his eyes upon thee. He put his faith back in God. That's a principle. You know, forget how long ago it happened. It's a, it's a universal principle that we take our eyes off of the problem, and this was the whole group of people, that, uh, armies that had joined together, and there was no way that uh, Judah could win in a battle, confrontation. So it's a situation like you and I have been in many times. Something is arrayed against us, it seems. There's a, there's a problem that's a lot bigger than we are. And, you know, we, so we have this first reaction of fear. But that shouldn't be our last reaction. So many of us dwell there. We stay there too long. And this is what the alternative Christian message is. It's there's a way out of this. There's a way to deal with this. Jehoshaphat didn't exactly tell the truth when he said he didn't know what to do. He said, I don't know what to do about that, but I know what to do otherwise, spiritually. I turn to the Lord. So the Lord spoke through a prophet uh, I hate to even try to pronounce his name, Jehaziel, Jehaziel, Jehaziel. And, and I love this. You will not need to fight this battle. Fear not, and be not dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Go out against them, and the Lord 
will be with you. So the problem is still there. Nothing's changed. But this prophet, which is that still small voice of God within us, it stands up and says, this is not your battle. Yes, it's a problem in your life, but you don't have the resources to handle it. You don't need them. There's a power greater than yourself working through you at this very moment. So Jehoshaphat does something very interesting that uh, we should take note here. He orders singers. They're, they're told to go out and meet this enemy, which is totally opposite of what you think he would do. But he orders singers to go before them singing praises. That's symbolic of an affirmative state of mind. I don't know how this is going to be solved. I just know it is. That's our, us sing, sending out our singers ahead of us. I don't know how this is going to be solved. I just know it is. The forces arrayed against Judah, this is another interesting thing, began to fight amongst themselves. And they actually destroyed one another. So the kingdom of Judah went out to where they had all destroyed each other and they, for three days, picked the spoils from their enemies. So in other words, they prospered as a result of trusting the Lord. So this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. It's, 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 if you see this mountain and you say, be cast into the sea and you don't doubt in your heart, if you look at the actions of, of this nation Judah under Jehoshaphat, all of their actions say faith. They say they're moving toward a solution. And by actions, I mean attitudes and the whole thing. It's a, it's a bringing your whole being to bear on the answer rather than recoiling in fear up against the the uh, marauding armies or the, the mountain or whatever it is that stands in our way. And just watch yourself. It's what goes on inside of us that matters. You know, we talk about when is the kingdom going to come? You can answer that question. When am I going to be at peace? When am I going to recenter in my place of power, my center of power? And here's what I would say. If you want to know when your prayer is answered, you've got a problem and you're trying to resolve it through prayer, you want to know when it is resolved. It is resolved the moment you return home, the moment you return to that center of power. And you know that you've done it because you're okay with whatever the outcome is. You're powerless in that regard. You're letting the greater power of your being, that which is expressing as in and through you help you find a resolution. Does that mean that you won't do anything? It doesn't. These people were told to go out, you know, in, in the face of this danger, to go ahead and live your life just as you always would, only do it fearlessly. Don't do it from a, a place of fear. Do it from your center of power. And there's a huge difference, and I'm sure you've all had that experience where you're dealing with something, you don't know how to handle it, and you come from a, a weaker place, and something happens in yourself, you solidify at some point, and you say, I backed up far enough, this is not where I'm going to go. However it works out is good, I'm okay with it. You've found your center of power. And you are at a place where you're no longer doubting in your heart. Now the doubts may come five minutes later. But get back to that place. Go back to that place. There's nothing wrong with being afraid. I think we beat ourselves up for doing that, for reacting in fear. I shouldn't be afraid. I shouldn't have reacted that way. It's not how you react. It's what you do after that. You know, Jehoshaphat was reacted in fear, and then he sought the Lord. And that's what we do. We all forget. You get the wind knocked out of you, and it takes a while to, to, to get your breath back. But that's not a sign of weakness. The, the, the strength is, I'm powerless to handle this. 
And I, I don't like that term in the way that we might normally be thinking of it. Like, I have no power, because you are the power of God in expression. Every one of us are. What we're doing, though, is instead of using the power of our personality or our ego or whatever, we're drawing upon a, the power greater than all of that. And that's a very different thing. We all have access to it. It's the, it's the prodigal son coming home and, and then being supported by his family, by his home. It's not a, uh, it's, it's, it's a power by, uh, by birth, by birthright, spiritual birthright. We're all expressions of God. And we are not powerless in that regard. We're powerless in terms of what do I have in my pocket to solve this problem? I may not have enough. I don't know. I don't have the right ideas. I don't know how to handle this. So I'm looking at my own resources. In that regard, it is a positive thing to say I am powerless to do anything about this. But we're not saying that we don't have access to power, the, the spiritual power that is the very essence of our being. We're making a shift, basically from the self-image to the soul. This reservoir, this uh, expression of, of infinite power. And you know when you've done it because your fear leaves. You know when you touch that place, that center of power, because your fear leaves. God within is our center of power, the source of our strength. If we are drawing our strength from what we have rather than from who we are, we may discover that we don't have what it takes to win the battle. And that's what I just said. It's If we're drawing upon our, our own arsenal of... of uh, uh, tactics or whatever ways to handle a problem and we're out of ideas, then we're powerless. But that's not what we're drawing upon. The uh, important thing about a crisis of faith, reaching the end of your rope, is when that happens, you usually discover that power greater than yourself because you're not relying upon your own power because you don't have any. You go through all this fear thing and then you remember, I wasn't given a spirit of fear. There's a deeper element in me that I have not been tapping. I'm out in the far country someplace. It's time to go home. And what did the prodigal son say when he was hit rock bottom out there? He came to himself, found his center of power. That's when his prayer was answered. That moment he was still out there in the far country, his prayer was answered because he came to himself. He found his center of power. And we do the same thing. Jesus and Jehoshaphat are describing a very definite shift in focus. How will the mountain be cast into the sea? How will the army be defeated? We don't know. Whatever that happens to be in your life right now, you don't have to know the answer. We only know that our eyes are upon thee. Our faith is in God. And that's what we need to make sure we're doing. We don't have to do it. We can suffer if we want. Suffer as long as you want. The prodigal son went pretty far out there. So just to recap on this, put your faith in God. That sounds like a very simple thing. But get back to, your, back to your, the thing that brought you here. Look at your faith. Look at your understanding of God. What is this whole spiritual thing about? Is it just because it feels good or sounds good or does it actually work? Will it fly an airplane? You know, that's what we want to know. Will it solve this problem? Will it move this mountain or get rid of this enemy? That's what we're asking. Is my faith really in God? You don't have to know the outcome to regain your power. In fact, you will regain your, your power before you know the outcome. And you will know that you've done that because you'll be okay with whatever the outcome is. Something in you will shift. You'll say, I'm good. Greater good is now unfolding, however it is meant to be. If it's the way I hope it is, that's fine. If it's not, that's fine too. But greater good will unfold. Third thing is to enter your life with singing, a high expectation of the greater good unfolding. It's an attitude. You don't have to necessarily sing. That might offend some people around you if you're doing that. <laughs> My voice is so out of shape right now, I think I would offend anybody but um 
it's an attitude. Um, I go into my life not as this, you know, I'm fighting this big battle, but that the battle's already won. The battle is not mine. And that's really a, a fun thing, a fun thing, because you, you then get more creative. You bring your creativity back into your life. You see things that you weren't seeing so much before. How many of you have seen the, the green shoots poking up, you know, in the ground? If you've got a problem, maybe you haven't seen that, but today when you go home, go look, because, and, and just let that be a reminder. There's, life is coming. Life is unfolding. You don't have to know how that works for it to happen. It's pretty miraculous, but we take it for granted. But it's the same with whatever's going on in your life now. It's popping up in ways that maybe you uh, would expect and maybe you won't. But that doesn't matter how it's done. The way this story unfolds, nobody would have thought that. Nobody would have thought the enemy would start fighting amongst themselves and resolve the problem and that, that the battle really wouldn't be ours. So it's a, it's, a, it's a thing to look at, but to me it's the genius of Jesus because the principle that he talks about in, in, the, in his prayer, uh, method of prayer, and the principle in the actual story of the Old Testament is exactly the same. It's exactly the same. It's what's going on in you, finding that center of power. Okay. You've been watching a talk presented at the Unity Church of Grand Junction by Reverend Doug Bator. We would like to thank everyone who joined us here today in beautiful Grand Junction, Colorado, as well as those of you who are joining us online. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to our channel. Also, please feel free to share this video with anyone you think might be interested or benefit from this message. If this video brought value to your life, please consider making a donation by clicking the link below to our PayPal donation account. Thanks again so much for watching.